fears that I have already conquered. Telling people that I sell sex supplements. <laughs> I used to be very scared and very anxious to overtly say that, oh, I have a company called Aphrodi. It's a sex supplement. It improves libido and sexual performance and confidence and drive. And yeah, I help guys have better sex. I was afraid to say that. I've conquered that fear now. What else have I conquered? Standing up for my belief that science and rationality are not the answer to everything. You need to do shit and take action and let your body learn. If you haven't figured it out already, today's video is about fear. A lot of you have asked how I overcame my fears. So I came up with about 26 fears that I have overcome and seven fears that I am currently working on overcoming. And I'm going to talk about the neuroscience literature, especially over the last 10 years. What do we know about fear? What is the fear circuitry in the brain? What do the rat experiments show us? What do the human experiments show us? What do the monkey experiments show us about emotions, about memory, about attention? What have psychiatrists and psychotherapists done in their practice, in their clinical practice, to target PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very extreme form of fear. I know a few guys in the Aphrodite Academy talked about how if someone undergoes childhood trauma, be it you know, being away from their father or their parents are always fighting or they get molested or raped or something really environmentally dangerous happens, detrimental happens, which puts this memory inside them, this, this very strong memory trace, which is known as an engram, which is really hard to unlearn. So what, does, what do we know, what science do we already know in terms of those memory traces that are in us from childhood? And this could also have to do with approaching women. This can also have to do with you know, seeing a hot girl and going up to her, having the balls to say hello and say, hey, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Farhan. What's your name? Today at Whole Foods, I was there in line. And uh, you know, so the way our Whole Foods works here, in, I'm in Brooklyn. I live here in Brooklyn near Barclays Center. So there's a Whole Foods here. So I went there to get a whole big chicken, kale and broccoli, so just to get three things. So I'm in line and there's a line for uh, under seven, three things, under seven items. And then there's a line for eight or more items and then another line for eight or more items. So I, got in, I get in the line for the seven or, or less items and there's like 13 people in the line. Whereas in the eight or more, there's two or three people. So I get in line and, and by the way, there was a quite a good looking girl who I kind of saw from my periphery come right behind me as I was walking in line. So I was a little bit, you know, I saw her and I was going to the line and I just kept going and she kept coming behind me. So I'm right here in line and, and I did, she's beautiful the girl, I'll tell you what happened with her. And she's, you know, she was right there and I wanted to make the move and I, I, I just didn't, I just didn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna admit it, I, I pushed out. Anyway, and, and obviously this happens, you know, this is New York, there's hot girls everywhere and I do puss out. So I get in line and she's right behind me. So I'm like, uh, this is stupid. There's like 13 people in this line. I'm gonna go to this one. And as I go to the next line, she follows me into the line with, you know, with eight or more items, even though both of us only had three items. She was buying some kombucha. So it turns out at Whole Foods, the kombucha is $2.59 and usually it's like four or five dollars. So I'm like, oh, $2.59? And she's like, uh, yeah, uh, how did you know? I'm like, oh, I got 12 yesterday. I did, I got like a dozen kombuchas yesterday. So we start talking and, and, and then I ask her, um, uh, what did I ask her? Oh, um, um, uh, where are you from, right? Do, do you, are you from New York? So she's like, no, I'm from Jersey. I'm like, oh, uh, 
so when you were growing up, were you embarrassed to tell people that? <laughs> because, you know, we have this thing in New York, like Jersey is kind of lame. Anyway, so she's like, yeah, yeah, where are you from? So I'm like, Pakistan. So she's like, oh, wow, it's so, that's so badass. You're from Pakistan. You know what's happening in Pakistan? It's like not really good what's happening nowadays. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's always like that. Anyway, so we start talking and now it's my turn to go, you know, forward into to actually do my groceries. And she's right there. And, uh, and, 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 you know, she, she's reading my jacket. You know, I wear this pimp jacket with all the dreams on it. And, you know, I've, I've painted the whole jacket. It looks awesome. Anyway, so she's reading the jacket. She's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's, you know, my friends and family hand wrote their dreams. They send me those pictures and I forged them the best way I could. And she's like, wow, that's so cute. That's so cool. And then she touched me. You know, she touched my arm a little bit like that. And then, um, and then I'm like, and then, I'm, you know, it was my turn to go. And so, so right before I went, I'm like, by the way, what's your name? Katie. Hi, Katie. My name is Farhan. Oh, Farhan. What a beautiful name. I'm like, thank you. Uh, and uh, anyway, so, so then as I'm going, I said, I'll talk to you soon because I did want to continue this conversation. Now, so far, what I did with her, yes, I had fear. Yes. Like, yeah, there was fear. But as I had the fear, I was doing it anyway. So I go, uh, I get my stuff. You know, I, I'm talking to the guy. I think he's gay. The guy who was uh, giving, you know, uh, getting the cash, being the cashier. And he was kind of like hitting on me. So I was like, dude, hurry the fuck up. You know, I need to talk to this girl. Anyway, so I got my stuff. Then I waited for her and I was looking at the line to see what, what else was going on. If other people, you know, because these 13 people in the line before, they're stupid, they're morons because they're standing in line so long. Anyway, so she comes up, I'm like, so look, Katie, look, look how, look at these morons. So she's like, yeah, they're so stupid. Anyway, so we, we keep going. We're walking, we're walking and check this. And, and you know, we're talking about different things. Uh, she asked me what I did. So I told her, you know, I uh, sell sex supplements. I opened up my jacket and you know, Afro D right here. I'm actually gonna, today's day 20. I need to make it right now and, and, and raw dog. Anyway, so I show her my um, sex up. So she looks at it, she's like, libido, confidence, oh, cool. And then she gave it back. And then I put it in my pocket and I went. And then she lived just down the street a little bit further. And I got to my, uh, you know, State Street. That's where I live. It's just a couple of doors from where Jay-Z used to live back, uh, back in the day. Anyway. So uh, we, we stop and, I, and, and then I find out she's a, she's a, her mom is 100% Lithuanian and her dad is Irish. Anyway, so you know I make fun of the fact that her name is Katie. Uh, some noise is going on. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, and, and, and you know, she's Lithuanian, she doesn't even have a cool name. Anyway, and then I said, uh, so as I'm going in to my, to my, you know, to go into my house, I'm like, hey, um, you want to become friends? So she's like, yeah, absolutely. And then so she pulls out her phone. She's like, give me your number. So I, she calls me, puts in my name, Farhan. You know, I kiss her here, here, the Eastern European kiss, and I keep going. Anyway, that entire incident that happened today, I would have never done that ever, ever, ever before my RSD days, ever. I wouldn't have even done that after my RSD days. These types of smooth pickups are a recent phenomenon which took years of practice. And I'm gonna get to this fear and other fears in this video. Very, very crucial video. A lot to cover, a lot of science, but a lot of practical stuff too. Other fears I've overcome. Uh, showing my dick to a girl and getting naked every chance I get and flaunting my body. Now, for example, when I was in the, when we were in the kitchen, you know, we were in Bali last year, me and my ex, and uh, one time I wanted to go to the kitchen real quick to get something and I just went naked. And she was like, oh my God, you know, like all the neighbors are gonna see him naked. Like, I didn't give a fuck, I just did it. I would have never done that before. I was so proud to show my naked body showing my dick to men in the locker room. So when I was a kid in the REC Center in Euless, Texas, I would walk around and I would see all these white people with these dicks hanging out and my dad, me and my brother never did that. We were like covered up. 
And now in the locker room, I'm the guy who's the most naked. Like in the sauna, I'm naked. I've never seen anyone naked in there. And you know, it's New, it's, it's New York, it's, it's America. It's a kind of a conservative place, not New York, but America is. But I am naked as much as I can be. And I'm gonna get into exposure therapy very soon, which is one of the ways I did that. Okay, crying loudly during movies. Now it naturally comes out. I had a fear of that, now I don't. What else have I overcome? Telling people my sexual secrets. The fact that I had sex for the first time at age 33. No shits or fucks given. Telling people I had low testosterone and that's why I started Afro D. For myself. No fear at all. Talking to a random person when I feel like it and being completely honest. Now, the fear and anxiety still there before some honesty, but I still do it. I still say it. Calling people out on their bullshit, putting them in their place. My roommate recently, he sometimes sleeps late, has a lot of vulgar language, lacks empathy, and a lot of people in the house hate him, but no one tells him. I told him yesterday, I had a long talk with him, and just straight up, very, very honest with him. And no one does that, and that's something I'm not afraid of anymore, just like I'm being honest to you guys. Being the best dressed guy in the room, Man, I was scared to do that. I was scared to show how amazing I look in different clothes. And now, I remember one time I was at a salsa congress in Montreal. I got runner up for best dressed in like 500 people in the venue, guys and girls included. And I was runner up. And the only reason the other guy won is because he's more popular. Um, I started my own fashion line in New York last year, like literally a fashion line. It's called Farhan's Dream. If you go to Instagram, at Farhan's Dream, Farhan S and then Dream, you'll see the entire thing that, you know, whatever I did. And I even invented a few things this year uh, to go along with that. Fear of living in a foreign country with nothing. L two years ago, I went to Colombia with only my cell phone, nothing else. So there, there's an example. I barely knew Spanish. I mean, now I'm fluent or almost fluent, but there I didn't know. Fear of telling my parents and close relatives what I really feel. I have no problem telling people exactly who I am and being honest with them. Fear of being away from my phone, social media, texts, and WhatsApp. Before I had FOMO. What if I miss something? What if I miss some content? Now I've completely detoxed myself from social media. So everything that happens in the Afro-D Academy, all the questions that I answer, I do it on a Google Sheet, and we've hired a social media team which takes those answers to social media and posts it for me, so I don't actually have to be on social media. I haven't consumed any Instagram in like four months. None. I've detoxed myself and I'm not afraid anymore to do that. Fear of telling people upon, about my insecurities, like I was a virgin till 33. Um, I'm still working on myself to develop myself sexually and socially. I'm still doing it, and I'm not afraid to tell anyone that. I was fear of my affiliation with RSD. I was scared about that before. You know, what would happen to my reputation? What if I can never get a job? What if I tell people that I used to be an RSD coach and I used to you know, travel with the RSD instructors all over the world? Um, now I'm not afraid of that anymore, and I'm gonna tell you why and everything that goes about overcoming fears. Fear of saying, I don't know. Now, if you ask me something and I don't know, I'll just say it. I'll say, look, this is what this, we know. This is what the science knows. This is what I've read. But all of this stuff, I have no clue. Don't ask me. I can't answer you. Go to this person. Fear of telling girls about my sexual anxieties of the past and still what I have today. I'm very open with women now. I tell them straight up exactly how I feel. Even if I get rejected, that's fine. So that's one insecurity I've overcome. Fear of saying no and staying true to what I want. Even if someone is my relative or even my parents, if they ask me to do something and I can't, I just say no. Can you come with me to this event? No. Can you please help me out, set this up? I need to move my house? No. Fear of dressing up like a woman <laughs> last year. Uh, the Afro-D Academy, the, the group coaching guys gave me this dare to dress up like a woman for a day. I did it. I was scared as shit, but I did it. 
Fear of doing improv and speeches in front of people. Now I'm an expert at that. Fear of leaving New York City. Fear of not developing myself fast enough. Don't care. Fear of traveling to a country where I don't speak the language. Been there, done that. Fear of not making... Um, uh, not, fe fear of not making an A. Fear of not being perfect. Don't care. Doesn't matter. Fear of facing myself and learning about myself through inner work. Before I was scared. You know, as a scientist, it's like the spirituality, inner work, it's bogus. It doesn't exist. But that world does exist. Big time. And I'm not scared of that anymore. Fear of, face, uh, fear of letting go. There's, uh, there's many friends in my life who've screwed me over. Big time. They've stolen money from me. There's a guy who owes me $25,000 US. Another guy who owes me $3,000 US. They just stole money from me. Previous business partners have stolen from me, uh, double-crossed me, stabbed me in the back. I had a fear of letting all that go. I've let it all go. Um, cut many friends out of my life. No fear of that. And the final few. Fear of admitting that I am smart, good-looking, and an alpha leader. I used to have this fear of success. You know, fear of standing up to people and say, yes, I am badass. I am a doctor. I am a PhD. I studied hard. I am very, very smart. And I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm very, very fucking good at what I do. I'm not afraid to say that anymore. Fear of approaching RSD Tyler. The first time I approached RSD Tyler at Summit, I had massive fear to do that. The first time I saw Elliot Hulse and I went and hugged him. Massive fear to do that, but I overcame it. Uh, Benicio Del Toro, the celebrity. Shah Rukh Khan, another big celebrity. Christian Dunst, these celebrities I've met. Damon John. I had fear of all these people, but I overcame it. I faced it. Now, the seven fears that I'm currently facing, that I'm still working on. The fear of openly in the train cafe street telling a girl that I'm attracted to her and being sexual and transparent. I haven't mastered that. I have a fear of that. I still have deep, deep shame about that. And I'm working on it every day. Fear of going back to Montreal, leaving living the French lifestyle and gaming French girls. Look, I left Montreal in 2013 to go to Vegas for RSD and learning pickup and how to talk to girls. Montreal was where I failed first. I failed there. I tried, you know, I tried to have sex with girls. I tried to bring girls home. I had limp dick, just massive issues lot of anxiety, just drank a lot of alcohol, never gamed sober, it was horrible for me. And I left, I escaped Montreal to go to different places. Now, I used to have a fear of going back and I still do a little bit because I'm gonna have to game in French sometimes, the French girls, and I'm trying to learn French every single day. I'm, I'm there, I'm getting there, still have a couple of months, I'm going to Montreal May 1st. That fear is going away. Um, Fear of staying in New York City, it's expensive here, living with roommates and being social uh, in places where it's really difficult. You know, I still have that fear. Fear of reading Carl Jung, it's very hard to read the dark side stuff, the Jordan Peterson stuff. Going deep inside to explore, learning about spirituality and my deep self, going inner to explore that world, it's really, really hard. I'm trying to do it. Fear of communicating with supermodels, girls who look like they are out of the fucking Victoria's Secret fashion show. I'm scared, man. When I see a girl who is at, who's a 10, like a fucking porn star, supermodel, catwalk girl, I'm scared, man. Like, I don't feel I'm good enough for her. I'm working on that. I'm, and I'm using all my neuroscience hacks for that. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to share all that with you. Fear of being called Dr. Testosterone. You know, like fear that I'm a fraud, that I'm an imposter. Even Elliot had that. Tyler had that. I mean, they probably still have a little bit of it. Many other people have this imposter syndrome. So I have it too. Fear of getting fat and having a belly and gaining weight. You know, the caloric surplus. I always want, and I'm working on this now, to, you know, get big and gain muscle, but I'm sometimes scared that, you know, I'm gonna get some kind of belly happening, and as I grow my muscle and get bigger, 
everything is going to get bigger before I have to cut. So I have a fear of that, but I'm also working on that. So anyway, these are my fears. Today's day 20. <laughs> let's take, let's do a raw dog of Afro D. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're at the, in the Dirty 30 Challenge. No porn, no weed, no alcohol, no drugs, and Afro D every day. And we film as we take Afro D. And uh, let me film it real quick. I'll be right back. Take my camera here. This is day 20. All right, Afro D. Hey there, Afro D Academy people. Um, I am recording myself. Here is the fear and anxiety uh, board. Let me put this right here. As I, right there. So as I take uh, day 20 raw dog. Uh, by the way, this, so Afro D right here, this is the package if you don't know what it looks like. We take this in the morning, one teaspoon empty stomach every morning, one teaspoon, okay? Some people are still confused about that. I don't know why we've made it very clear on the package, but yeah, so this is a teaspoon and I raw dog. Mm. Amazing. Really getting used to the taste. And by the way, for those of you who want Afro D, there's gonna be a link in the comment below. Just click and go grab it. So let me, ah, day 20, day 20. <laughs> okay, I just turned on the, turn off the, the camera there. Okay, so yeah, so for those of you who want Afro D, click the link in the first comment or wherever it is on this page somewhere, maybe it's in the captions up, up there somewhere. But um, with Afro D, you get monthly workshops. The workshop that's coming up, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. We're still working on the title, but it's gonna happen uh, March, the weekend of March 16th. It's either gonna be on Saturday or Sunday. We're still working out the time. We're gonna get all those details, but we have workshops every month. That's included with, if you get Afro D, you get that workshop for free. The four workshops we've already had, four or five workshops we've already had, plus all the webinars and workshops before Afro D even started, all of that is available on the members only Afro D website. There's articles on there, there's specific videos on there, and there's challenges on there, specific challenge that are not part of this testosterone transformation group. It's only part of the Afro D Academy group. So that's there. We have a Facebook group that is members only which has great content. You got elite badass men. We have 150 members now in the Afro D Academy. So join and get all of this stuff for free, 24 seven support. I answer all of your questions. I even do a one-on-one -on -one with you to coach you. Um, we do this every Sunday and then you see these videos on Thursdays. This is a Tuesday video right now. Uh, every Thursday I do that one-on-one -on -one, uh, post on this Facebook group. So just look out for these things. Every Tuesday from now on, you get a video like this. Every Thursday you get a one-on-one -on -one video. And every Friday we're gonna do a general video for YouTube and Facebook and just general audience who are not in this group or the Afro D Academy. The last two workshops, I also explain neuroscience biochemistry. There was a workshop about habits. Go see that, that's in the units. And there was, uh, so that was about how to quit porn addiction. And the one I just did was about weed, about marijuana and how that affects testosterone, libido, masculinity, sperm and procreation and cognitive function, really, really good stuff. Today's video is about fear. So, make sure my recording is on. So today's video is about fear, anxiety. Uh, what do we know in terms of the brain science behind that? How can we use that brain science to overcome our own fears? Um, do we need to erase old memories or do we need to recreate new memories and the old memories stay? Or do those old memories get updated? What is fucking going on in the brain? And some of this research is very, very sexy. Like you're gonna love learning about this. I've drawn a rat here. Uh, just to show you what they do with the rat experiments, how they actually figure out how a rat overcomes fear. Because I don't know if you know this yet, but 
the rat brain, I mean, I dissected many rats and I did rat experiments for three years during my master's degree. A rat brain structurally, anatomically, and even physiologically, and even the sensory systems is very similar to the human brain. Now, of course, we have the ability to meditate and make decisions and plan our events and have consciousness and, 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 and a conscience and go, we can go deep inside ourselves. We know we have our own mind. Rats probably don't have this stuff, but the basic structures of the brain are still there. So when it comes to basic fear memory and fear conditioning and overcoming fear, fear extinction, those things still apply because in terms of evolution, we've come from that shit. So the evolutionary mismatches that happen or things that we should be afraid of 300,000 years ago, but not today, those things apply to us. And, and knowing about the rat biochemistry, the rat physiology, neurophysiology, we can learn a lot. Okay, so it's gonna be, I'm gonna talk about things for, in a random way. And as I talk about them, I'm just gonna cross them out. Um, or I'll just erase, I'll erase them or cross them out, whatever I feel like. Okay, the first thing I wanna mention is, okay, the blue, I'm going to get to at the very end. One, two, three, four, five, six. These six, one, two, three, four, five, six, are the solutions that I've experienced to overcome my fear. And I'm going to go through each one of these. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you a challenge. This is a unit challenge. This is a video challenge that I'm giving you. For those of you who want to take action and actually learn something from this, you'll get a challenge from me at the very end, so keep watching. Okay, so the first thing we wanna talk about is this right here, PTSD. This right here, okay? So, um, as I cover it, you know what I'll do? I'll just cross it out. That means I've covered it. Actually, I'll, I'll erase it. Let's just erase it. Okay, let's talk about PTSD, okay? I'll erase it. Okay. The way we study fear in physiology, in, the, in neuroscience, is we look at, in terms of clinical practice, we look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So when army veterans or people who get molested or raped or people who've gone through some childhood trauma, some very deep, deep anxiety, those are the best people to study because they have the most elevated, the most extreme fear. So this is what we study in the clinical practice. This is what clinical psychologists, therapists, um, and, and, and other healers, you know, medical healers, they treat PTSD. Now, the way we look at PTSD in the rat, well, you can do a lot of things. So the experiments that I'm gonna talk about, they use electrode connectors and fiber connectors. They connect it to the brain of the rat. This, is the, this red part is the brain, this is the rat. And then I sh I've shown these connectors here you know, for fiber and electrode. And they use many, many other things to either stimulate parts of the brain or to get brain activity from the brain. And this right here represents a speaker because they're using auditory stimuli, noise, sounds, to give stimulus to the rat, and they're also using peppermint and electric shock. So let me explain what this means. Imagine a rat, and the rat is in a cage, alone. He hears a sound, some random sound, you know, the auditory system works, he can hear it, and he gets shocked. He hears the same sound, he gets shocked. Same sound, shocked. And that happens over and over and over for a month. So after that entire month, the rat associates the electric shock with a certain sound. That's his trauma. That's his PTSD. That's his fear. So now he'll hear the sound, but he won't get the electric shock and he'll have fear. And what rats do, or mice in this case, what mice do is they freeze. And I noticed this when I was studying rats back in my master's degree. 
before I did my PhD with monkeys, I was studying rats, I was dissecting rats, I was doing memory experiments with rats, and this is a lot about memory, so it's a really sexy topic for me. So what I noticed is, when I, when, you know, when I first went to handle the, handle the rats, dude, like I couldn't handle them, right? So you have to grab the rat by the, like imagine this is the rat, you have to grab him like this and pick him up, and then put him in the cage, right? Grab him like this, put him in the cage. And I wasn't very good at handling them. So I would fuck around and not grab him correctly and the rat would start running everywhere. And then he could sense that I'm scared. He could sense my fear. So the rat would just freeze. And dude, when the rat froze, I got so scared because I knew if I touched it, he'd start biting the shit out of me. So rats and mice, they freeze when there's fear. So the freezing response happens when this, there's this electric shock, so, you know, they get the shock, but when there's the no, now, without the shock, when there's that sound which produced the shock, the mice freezes because he's scared shitless. You know how we freeze when we have fear? You know, we, we have this pausing, like, oh my God, he froze up, he froze up. This happens in mice too. Interesting, hey? Now, some sounds were associated right, with peppermint. This is known as an appetitive or appetitive, whatever it's called, appetite, right? It's, it's a positive thing associated with the sound. So sometimes you'll get a sound and you get the electric shock, but the rat freezes. And sometimes other sounds, not the same sound, obviously, then the rat would get confused. We don't want to confuse the rat. Other sounds, he gets peppermint in his tongue. So now it's an appetitive stimulus or a, 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 a positive stimulus, right? Positive, negative, right? So the shock is an aversive stimulus, negative, and the, the peppermint is a positive stimulus. We'll talk about, we'll call it positive and negative. Now, the rats learn it so well, they start associating these particular sounds with negative, so they, sh they freeze, and these other sounds with positive, and they taste it, they don't freeze, they love that. So now they have this conditioning, they have this fear conditioning response. Now what happens is, after 30 days or longer, how are you going to get the rat to reverse that, right? Because if you can get a rat to reverse, I'm going to turn my phone off, so I'm getting disturbed here. If you can get a rat to reverse that response to fear, then maybe you can learn something about a human being who, who has PTSD. So they've done a lot of experiments and they've found some really, really interesting things. So let me, now, now you understand this thing. So I'm gonna delete it, erase it. I hope you understand. And remember, if you guys don't understand this or don't have any idea, what the fuck I'm talking about, post in the comments below. I'll make a video in the future explaining this or I'll answer you. And also in the comments below, ask me what video you want me to do next week or the week after. We've got like tons of dozens of uh, 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 inquiries and, and requests. So keep sending requests. We're going to pick the best stuff. Okay. Now, with fear, anxiety. Okay, we, we understand. Okay, now let's get to Nader. Kareem Nader. So Kareem Nader is this badass guy from McGill, my university. I know the guy, I went to his talks. He discovered something really interesting about fear and memory. He discovered that, so, you know, for decades we used to think, how does memory work? I mean, how does fucking memory work, right? Because if you want to understand fear, well, fear lives in memory. You have to understand memory before you can understand fear. So this is how memory basically works. You get exposed to a certain stimulus. And because it has a very emotional significance, there's emotional attachment re related to that memory, you remember it. You pay attention to it. It goes from short-term or working memory to long-term memory, right? Working memory is things you do all the time. You know, your prefrontal cortex is involved in that. So remembering someone's number, remembering someone's name that, you, that you're interacting with, remembering where you are, uh, your environment, 
who you just met, you know, what, where you were walking. Like these are all in your working memory, second by second by second. Then you, you, you hear something, a fact, that's in your short-term memory, but it's gonna go away. But, not go away, you're gonna forget it. But if there's an emotional significance to it, something that is funny or new or related to arousal or sex or food, you're gonna remember it. And that's gonna become a long-term memory, so you're gonna remember it in the months to come or the years to come. And because those PTSD moments when we're kids, and this includes approaching women or standing up to your parents or starting a new company, being an entrepreneur, quitting your job, learning a new language, moving to a different country, being naked in front of people, uh, working out at the gym when you don't look good, talking to a, 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 a someone who's smarter than you or you think is smarter than you, get, asking your boss for a raise. I mean, all of these things are super practical and in, if they're in our long-term memory and stored for a long time, then it's very hard to unlearn that. And that's what this talk is about today. Okay, so in order for these memories to go from short-term to long-term, they have to be consolidated. Consolidation. It basically means taking something short-term that you just learned and storing it somewhere in your cortex so you remember it a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. That's called consolidation. What Kareem Nader found out, and others, is a concept of a reconsolidation. Super sexy concept. How does it work? Imagine you learned something when you were a kid. If you recall that memory, you're gonna reconsolidate it. And the way you're gonna remember that memory is based on your current environment. It's based on your current state. It's based on your current mood. For example, let's say your wife cheated on you. It's at night and uh, you're depressed. You got your dick in your hand. You're gonna curse your wife. That memory of your ex-wife, who let's say she, you know, she cheated on you with a milkman or whatever, um, that memory is gonna trigger you in a negative way and you're gonna curse your wife. But now let's say that you remarried and you have kids and you're in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife, beautiful kids, you're on vacation in Hawaii and someone mentions your ex-wife and you remember her, you're gonna have a completely different memory of her. See, the event that happened in the past is exactly the same, but your reconsolidation of it is different. And it turns out that there is actual protein synthesis that happens when memories are reconsolidated. This is not some woo-woo bullshit. This is a real shit in the brain. When you recall a memory from the past, based on your current state, you will remember that memory in that way, based on your current environment, your current mood, your current state of mind, your current, sis, your current status in life. How crazy is that? And Kareem Nader figured that out, or him and others. There's this concept of reconsolidation. So you know when Eckhart Tolle says, be in the present moment, you know, everything is now. It's kind of true. I recall a memory, if I'm in the here and now, the emotions involved around that memory are gonna be what I'm experiencing here and now. It's very interesting. We're not gonna get into present moment stuff right now, but this is something to, to understand, right? This concept of reconsolidation. Okay, now let's get into sci-fi happens today, direct removal, right here. Okay, next I wanna convey how serious I am. Again, we're gonna to get to the solutions at the end, 
what to do about it. But I want to set this up for you so you understand where we're even coming from. I want you to understand the problem of fear. This is not something easy. If you've suffered from fear your whole life, you need to understand that I had to use my entire neuroscience training, my 10 years of graduate school, and sit down and understand why the fuck did I have all these fears and methodically figure all this out. So I'm giving you my 10 years of learning here in, in an hour or two. So you need to pay close attention and learn all this stuff really, really well so you can go out there and conquer fear for the rest of your fucking life. And, re and remember, this group, Testosterone Transformation, the Afro-D Academy, we are here to make you more confident. That's why I'm giving you these teachings that I've learned. Because when you go out in life, and someone argues with you about testosterone or diet or confidence or social anxiety or whatever, you can stand up for yourself and tell them the science and they'll shut the fuck up because there's a lot of hand wavers and, and dick grabbers in the world who uh, just, just don't know what they're talking about. They're very fraud and, and, and talking out of their butt. And I want you guys to be confident because you understand the science, the hardcore truth that is happening cutting edge right now in the scientific literature. So reconsolidation. Okay, before we get into that, let me explain to you how much we already know about memory because we've learned a lot of shit, man. So the way memory is consolidated, so from short term to long term is through this area called the hippocampus. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of this word, hippocampus. Okay. And the hippocampus, when you remove the hippocampus from the brain, Brenda Milner did this study, by the way, in patient HM. You can go look this up if you care. Patient HM. Brenda Milner, who I know, you know, I saw her in the elevator all the time. She's like 99 or 98 years old now, still teaching the medical school classes. She's teaching all the units. She's amazing. But Brenda Milner figured out by removing the hippocampus and the hippocampal region, the parahippocampal region around the hippocampus, when you remove that from both hemispheres, from the temporal lobe of the brain, that person forgets their memory three years before removal, and they are unable to recall what happened literally every day. So what, so what do I mean? Brenda, the, the, you know, the clinical researcher, would come in to patient HM. He would be like, oh, hello, nice to meet you. What's your name? And he had seen her for a year. He kept forgetting her every single day. This is like that movie... Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I haven't seen it, but I think it's a Jim Carrey movie. It's probably after this patient HM. So imagine every single day you go into a room and you say hello to someone and they don't remember you even though they saw you yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before. They've lost their ability to consolidate memory, which the hippocampus is essential for. And because Brenda Milner and, and Wilder Penfield and Scoville and these guys, they removed the hippocampus and the nearby regions from both hemispheres. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to cure his epilepsy and they did. The epilepsy went away, but the guy couldn't consolidate his memory. Anyway, what is this? Dude, these motherfuckers, sci-fi is real, man. Now what they can do, not in humans because it's unethical, but they can literally zap Neurons, destroy neurons through chemicals in certain parts of the brain to remove memories in these rats. So if a rat has learned fear and he's conditioned to a certain fear stimulus, they can zap certain neurons and connections and he will forget about that fear. Fucking unbelievable. And that's what this is. You can directly remove fear it's like sci-fi happening today. Okay, so we talked about that. We, reconsolidation, you understand. Hippocampus, patient HM. You can go look this up later. You know, this is just the title, fear, anxiety. We'll get into that. Okay. Dopamine. It turns out, when you, let's say you have a rat, and you've conditioned this rat to associate a certain 
sound with fear because he was getting shocked all the time. Now, in order for you to make that rat forget about that fear, now we're getting a little bit into the solution. There's something known as exposure therapy, which they also do in patients, and I've done this to myself also. When you expose yourself to something that you are fearful of over and over and over, but the danger is not there. So imagine you, ex imagine you expose the rat now to that sound, but you don't shock him. You do nothing. Now the rat starts associating the shock sound, but no shock. So he starts associating that sound with nothing, neutral. But it turns out, if you give him a positive stimulus, he learns that that sound is not negative faster. What do I mean by that? So imagine you kept giving the rat a certain sound, ping, and that ping shocked him. So every time I, he heard ping, he got shocked. So now in the future, even without getting shocked when he heard ping, he would freeze. Now what happens is you say ping, you don't shock him, nothing. Again, ping, you don't shock him, nothing. Over time, the rat will start unlearning the fear. It's known as exposure therapy. Therapists do it all the time, and I've done it in myself too, and I'm going to get exactly how I did it soon. Exposure therapy is when you put yourself in a position where you used to have that fear. You put yourself in that environment. You surround yourself with those people. You know, I talked about Montreal and, and, and French and how I had the fear of girls in Montreal and, and I failed and then I ran away to Vegas. Now I'm going back. I'm going to expose myself to that environment because that's the only way to overcome my fear of the French language, of the French people, of, of racism, of exclusivism, because there's a lot of that mediocrity shit in Montreal, racism type stuff. I mean, I'm not the only one who's suffered. Many others have suffered, but I'm a new man now. Let's see what happens. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be an interesting story. So that's exposure therapy. This happens with a lot of phobias. Therapists do that a lot. You know, people who have fear of heights, uh, fear of being alone, fear, fear of people, fear of um, uh, heights, fear of enclosed spaces, you know, congestion. Um, right? Uh, what is this called? Um, uh, claustrophobia, right? Obviously, I'm claustrophobic. All these things. So by exposing themselves to that more and more and being safe, right? Neutral, the fear is unlearned faster. Now, here is the key. If you associate that environment and that fear with something positive, a reward, then you will unlearn the fear faster. We talk about dopamine a lot. You know, the nucleus accumbens circuit I talked about in the last two videos when we talked about marijuana, we also talked about porn addiction. The nucleus accumbens is this area where dopamine is released. And that circuit is very important for the reward system. Anticipating reward, getting reward, feeling reward. It's a very important system, and even in fear conditioning. When you are in an environment where you used to have fear, and you used to have anxiety, and now you get reward, you will overcome the fear faster. Those rats, when they hear, bing, now let's say they get the peppermint, the good taste. Bing, bing. Now they start associating 
that nasty, scary sound with a positive reward. And they learn faster. Unlearn faster. And the fear goes away faster. So, dopamine is involved there. Super duper important. And exposure therapy. Now the question is, oh, SSRIs. So SSRIs are serotonin, uh, selective serotonin reuptake uh, inhibitor. Is that what it's called? Um, yeah, it's essentially the transporter or the reuptake receptor which recycles serotonin back into the neuron that it's released from. And when you block that, more serotonin is released into the synapse and that is an antidepressant, right? The more serotonin you have, the less depressed you'll be, roughly speaking. Um, and SSRIs, antidepressants, are one of the ways therapists uh, battle fear and anxiety in their patients. We don't do that shit. That's not natural. We don't do that. But that's that. Now, here's, here's the ultimate question that have been, has been asked since, I think, like 1967, a guy named Kon, Konor, Konovrosky or something like that, he, he proposed this. Anyway, I'll talk about the circuit soon. But there was this concept of when you have trauma or when you have some kind of memory of the past and you do new things to overcome that fear, is it that that memory stays as you're learning new things? and you overcome that memory, but it's there? Or are you reprogramming that memory trace itself? How does unlearning actually happen? So imagine you have this memory in the past of your dad beating up your mom. This happens, it's very sad, but it happens in today's society and all over the world. Now today you have trauma of your dad beating up your mom. If there was an exposure therapy where now your dad is kissing your mom, hugging your mom, loving your mom in front of you, then will that memory stay? And now you have a secondary memory of your dad hugging your mom? Or will that initial memory change? and become more loving and more positive? Well, they had to figure this out in many ways, but why did they care about this? When they did exposure therapy to PTSD patients in hospitals and other places, they found that there was about a 30% relapse rate. They would always go back sometime during their lifetime to having that PTSD again or relapsing on the drug again or having that anxiety again at some point in their life. It was 30% chance, it's a huge, Percentage. So they said, well, there's this new trace, there's this new memory, but that old memory is still there. So in order for one, someone, to really target that fear, then that memory needs to be consolidated, reconsolidated, and changed. And when therapists started doing that with the positive stimuli, then they realized, and the reward that I erased, but the reward, when they started doing that, they realized that reconsolidating that memory was the only way that patient can permanently overcome fear. Okay? So, the original is not deleted. You have to bring back that thing you were afraid of and face it head on. And I'm going to get into how very soon. Okay. And before we get into all the, all the blues, let me finish this here. Okay. So essentially what's happening. Okay. What is this screeching cat? So imagine you're watching a movie and there's this person, a, a girl in the shower. She's taking a shower. She's beautiful. You're looking at her. And... It's dark and all of a sudden you hear this 
you're like, and the door is opening. They, 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 they take the scene to the door opening. It's like, now you're scared. What's going to happen? The door opens and boom, jumps out a cat. And you giggle. Ha 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 ha. So instead of that screeching that you thought was going to be like a rapist or a killer, is actually a beautiful, cute cat. So you giggle. So when you expose yourself to what used to be an aversive stimulus or a negative stimulus, but you counter that with a reward, right? So you're used to listening to screechy sound as something bad about to happen, something negative, something harmful, something fearful. But now you get this beautiful cat. It's a reward for you, reward for your system. So now your brain starts changing to associate that screeching with something lovely. So that's, what the, that's how the movies do it, uh, to, to keep you addicted and, 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 and okay, and, and, and keep watching that. All right, this final thing before we get into the solutions. When you have a neuron here, okay, call it neuron one, and it sends these neurotransmitters to neuron two, and okay, why am I showing this? This is called Hebbian learning, okay? All of fear is based on the brain learning that you are now afraid of something. That's what happened with my brain. So, when this neuron keeps firing, and every time this neuron fires an action potential, this neuron fires an action potential, then this connection gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So let's take a fear, uh, fear of public speaking. You get on stage and you pee in your pants. This became stronger. Why? Because when neuron one getting on stage, neuron two, fear and anxiety happened because you peed in your pants, this got stronger. This is very rough, by the way. This, uh, the brain is not two neurons, it's 100 billion neurons, but this is just roughly. I'm doing it very rough here, so you understand. You get on stage again, and you sneeze, and you have snot all over the stage, and people start laughing at you. This connection became stronger, stronger and stronger and stronger. Now you have a legit fear and anxiety of public speaking. That's how learning happens. That's how any learning happens. A musical instrument, a, a new sport, pick up. You gotta keep practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing and practicing. All right, now finally let's get to the solutions. Solution number one, failure. Bro. There is no easy solution to overcoming fear and anxiety. A lot of you watch my videos. A lot of you do the challenges, which is awesome. You take action. Some of those challenges, if you do them wholeheartedly, if you do them with your entire soul, then you will at least have a chance to fail. For example, fasting. If, you do a, if you're used to doing 24-hour fast and you do another 24-hour fast, you're not going to fail. Do a 72-hour fast. Do a 48-hour fast. Fail. Failure. One way I overcame all those 26 failures that I named at the beginning of this video is I failed. When I went to Colombia, without my phone, with only my phone, no bags, no laptop, no suitcases, nothing. I bought all my clothes there. Oh, by the way, I also shaved my head before I went. Because I wanted to overcome my fear of being bald. Or having no hair. The fact that I went there and to an extent, I failed. 
because I didn't have a lot of confidence without my hair. It was hard, it was fucking hard to be fully confident with a bald head. And you know, I shaved my entire head and for those two months, obviously my hair's not gonna grow back in two months. So I had to fail. When I first started my YouTube channel, I had a lot of fear. So I had to fail, I had to make a lot of bad videos. You can go back and watch my videos from three years ago, they're not very good. I had to fail. When I started Doc Testosterone, our first business, we kind of failed. You know, we were doing all these information products, kind of half-assing the videos, not very succinct, not very science-based, it was kind of shitty. We failed, but we learned. And now we have Afro D and we're doing amazing. And we're just fucking changing the world with it. So we had to fail. When I went to Vegas, I got rejected by a lot of girls. I probably should have got rejected even more and I hope I get rejected a thousand more times before I die, or maybe a hundred thousand times, who knows? Hope so. That's how I learned. I had to go out there and fail and get a lot of rejections. When I first started to convince my parents um, to believe me and have faith in me, I failed. They didn't believe me. They didn't have faith in me. There's been a lot of failure, man. A ton of failure. Okay? So you need to fail. Second. Action. You know, when I tell you, order Afro D. Some of you have excuses. Oh, I, this excuse and that excuse, it's bullshit. If you don't take action to improve your life, I mean, look, we've made it very easy. We're giving you discounts. We're giving you a, a buy four, get two free. If you buy for the whole year, it's a 50% discount. Like we're making it very easy for you to get this supplement. And to make it even a no brainer, the one-on-one -on -one sessions with me, the workshops with me, uh, the uh, monthly workshops, the, the Facebook group, the, 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 the members only website, the 24-7 the support, I mean, action. You have to do something to change your brain and overcome that fear. You know, a lot of the guys in the academy now, they're like, you know, we went through a 90-day transformation with the group coaching guys. I have one-on-one -on -one coaching with the 6XM guys. Um, who are, you know, it's a six-month program where I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Those guys... The guys I'm coaching one-on-one, -on -one, man, they're going through a dramatic transformation because they take action. They do the challenges. You who's watching right now, if you haven't done the 10, challenge in, is the 10 challenges in the testosterone transformation, you're not gonna overcome shit. You're not gonna overcome your fear. Why? Because you haven't taken action. When I graduated university, my, my PhD in neuroscience from McGill, Seven days later, I took the action of moving to Vegas. After Vegas, I took the action of going to live at strength camp with Elliot in the fucking gym for six months. I was there for eight months. Six of those months, I lived at the gym. Action. I worked out six days a week and learned how to weight lift. Action. I made hundreds of thousands of dollars for Elliot for the strength camp challenge and endorsements and sponsorships. Action. When I was with RSD, I managed you know, 19 interns and 50 students at Immersion. Action. When I had my recent girlfriend, you know, my ex, I wanted to surprise her in Stockholm. I went. Action. All those fears of intimacy, of sex, of communicating with women, of doing better in your business, of having success in your life, of being happy, meditating. Action. Second way to overcome fear, how I overcame it. Third, competence. If you read the book, so Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Cal Newport's a badass guy. 
He recently wrote Digital Minimalism, also a very good book. A lot of it I already knew, but if you're new to this field, you're going to love it. Cal Newport, check him out. He also has a blog, calnewport.com. In that book, So Good They Can't Ignore You, Cal says, the way to love your job, the way to love your career, the way to love what you do, is to be good at it, to be competent at it. Competence. Don't be a loser. Become good at something. Jordan Peterson says this all the time. The, the dominance hierarchy that women look at for social status to pick the men that are at the top of the dominance hierarchy. How do you get to the top? You become good at something. If you're whacking off all day and living with your parents, go get a fucking job. If you're in school, get the best grades. If you don't want to get, the good, get good grades, switch programs because you probably fucking hate what you're doing. If you don't want to go to school, don't go. Get a job. If you don't want to get a job, don't get a job. Start a company. If you don't want to start a company and you want to just meditate all the time, then meditate all the time. But become good at it so you can help others. Competence is the third way in which I overcame my fear. I'm actually really good at making videos. So I overcame my fear of making videos. I'm actually really good at communicating with girls. So I am overcoming my fear. I mean, I, I still can't talk to the supermodels, even though you know, I have dated quite a few hot girls. But my fear is still there. It's very innate. It's very much in me. So I'm overcoming it still. I mean, 37 years old, I mean, I don't give a fuck. Competence. Overcoming my, my fear of telling people I sell sex supplements. Well, I'm very good at it. Aphrodite is doing fantastic. Competence. So that's how I overcame those fears. I'm really good at coaching kids, you know, the, the kids at immersion. So telling someone I'm a pickup coach, or I was a pickup coach, no fear, because I'm very good at it. Telling people about diet and exercise, well, I'm really good at it. I'm really good at what I do. I more than doubled my testosterone levels and more than doubled many guys in the Aphrodite Academy's testosterone levels. My bioavailable testosterone is Superman level. So now I have competence. So I can say, yes, I am doc testosterone. Go look at my blood test, bitch. <laughs> right? So I have that competence. You need to have the competence to overcome fear. So that's the third key. Fourth key, pain. When you see a girl and you have a pain inside or love that you deserve the best or you have this pain inside that, man, how amazing of a world would it be when someone like me could give my love to someone like her, not take anything from her, but give because you are overflowing with love and joy and you love yourself so much and you've already recognized the anima inside you, right? Anima is the feminine energy inside. Not to spoil anything, but that's what the next Aphrodite workshop is going to be about. The anima and masculine and feminine energy inside of a man. Because one thing that I've learned is that instead of projecting what you lack inside, right? These fears that we have sometimes, it's things we lack inside, right? You know, the fear of dancing, right? Like today at the gym, I was like, you know, these the songs were coming on and I was like, just like getting in there as I was working out, man, it was sick. And I used to never do that. So I've overcome my fear of like literally like dancing at the gym, right? Just not giving a fuck. So yeah, I'm confident and I'm competent, but it's the pain of not understanding your own inner self, right? So when you have anxiety and you have fear because of what's around you, it's because sometimes you're trying to project or compensate for what you haven't recognized inside yourself and you're trying to project it onto someone else, like your parents, like your teachers. You might be projecting it on me or on people on YouTube or you're calling people trolls or you might be projecting it on Donald Trump or on the Nazis, or on the Arabs, or on the, on the terrorists, or on the whatever, politicians, or 
the, the actors or the social media celebrities or the photoshoppers or the drug dealers or you might be projecting what you lack inside and what you haven't understood on someone else because of your fears. But if you have enough pain, and what I mean by this painful love inside you, then you're going to start overcoming it. Okay? Pain. Meditation. This is a big one. So Luke, my spiritual mentor in Australia, he's also my best friend, Luke Bonner, um, Go look him up, awesome guy, and, and search him out because he's my spiritual mentor. I learn a lot from this guy. He's given me this meditation to do, which I do every night. It's in, in YouTube, type in Muji, which is a spiritual teacher. He's a Jamaican guy, a Caribbean guy. His YouTube channel is Muji, and the title of the meditation is This Exercise is All the Help You Need. It's a meditation exercise. I do it every night. And that meditation exercise has helped me a lot to overcome my fears. Because one thing I realize, man, is the mind is not who I am. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm using my mind. My senses are not my mind. That's my body. That's, you know, I'm sensing things. It's like beautiful sensing. But when I start overthinking, when I start thinking about fear and anxiety, that's my mind. So through meditation, what I've been able to do is remove my true self from my mind. So my mind may want all these things, but I'm like, no, I don't have to want it. I can want it for fun, but I don't need it. Yeah, I can go talk to that girl. Or, yeah, I can talk to my parents about what I really feel. Or I can stand up to my relatives. Or I can ask my boss for a raise. Or I can say fuck you to my teacher and say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Or I can start my own company. Or I can get this job. Or I can get into this tough school. Or I can get straight A's. I can finish this book. I can get away from porn addiction. I can quit marijuana. I can quit drugs and alcohol. Yes, because my mind is telling me I need all these things. My mind is telling me that I need to do that, or this is my purpose in life, or that's my purpose in life. You don't have to let your mind control you. That's going to help your fear a lot. That's helped me a lot. And last but not least, environment. Me being in New York is a big factor in my fear recovery. Me being in Vegas helped. Stockholm helped. Bali helped. I went to Africa, helped. I went to Syria, that helped. Traveled Europe, South America, all of America and Canada. All of these things that I've done, I've exposed myself to different environments. I've given my body a chance to learn. And now I'm putting myself in the old environments, like Montreal. Yeah, I had a chance to go to Kiev, almost booked my ticket. I actually did book my ticket to Medellin. I was going to go there. But these were pussy moves, easy way out. You know, I could go to Kiev and live a badass life there. You know, I live like a king there with how much money we're making. And, uh, I mean, anyone can live like a king with a decent salary. I could have done the same thing in Medellin, but I was like, no. I'm going to go back to my old hometown of Montreal and I'm going to face those fears. I'm going to face that culture, which I ran away from. Calling them mediocre and dumb and, you know, leeching from the government. Well, they are all that anyway. They are all that. It's true. But no reason for me to run away. I'm going to dominate and slay that fucking dragon. Then I'm going to come back here next year to New York. My time in New York is done. You know, I get a six-month visit every year because I'm Canadian. So my stay is almost over here. 
until I leave New York, I have March and April, I'm gonna overcome my fears as much as I can here. Talk to any, as many supermodels as I can. Listen, bro, it's not easy. You know, being a leader here of you guys, of the Aphrodite Academy, imposter syndrome steps in. A lot of responsibilities step in. You know, I have to make these videos, I have to answer a ton of questions, take care of the business. I mean, Imran is there helping me a lot. Don't get me wrong, that guy is a badass. I owe my life to him. We have an entire team now that does stuff for us. We've hired full-time people. Very proud of all that. We're growing our business. Thank God. But no easy way out. You have to expose yourself to the right environment. Go back to your old environments. Face it. Don't run away. Okay? That's the video about fear. Thank you for watching. Um, again, look in the comment if you are interested in purchasing Afro D. Get it right away. Join the academy. I look forward to seeing you there. Do all those challenges when, when you're there. You're, you're going to just love the academy. I swear to God, it's the best thing ever. The best group ever. I mean, this group is awesome too, but the Afro D Academy is just way more elite. So join that. Um, if you have any questions, comment below. I'll be happy to answer them. Look for these videos every Tuesday. Every Thursday is the one-on-one, -on -one, and every Friday is a general YouTube and Facebook video. Uh, thanks for watching. Love you so much. And uh, go overcome your fears, man. Go do it. This is Doc Farhan. Bye-bye. My bad. I almost forgot something. Oh, I almost forgot something. My bad. Challenge for you. I took off my jacket too. You can see my crunch. I'm not marketing this gym. It's just what I'm wearing right now. It's the gym I go to here. This is your challenge. You have 24 hours to submit this challenge in the comments below or make a separate post. I prefer you make a separate post into this group so we can all comment on your post. I want you to write every single fear you have already overcome fully. Make a list and post it. And make a second list of the fears you are facing right now and trying to overcome in your life. Just like I did and I listed your, my fears, the ones I've already overcome and the ones I'm working on right now, I want you to do the same, either make a video or write it down, take a photo and post it or just type it in as a post in this Facebook group. That is your challenge, 24 hours. Make it happen. This is Doc Farhan. I'll see you soon, man.